Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, we are at the verge of commencing the usual, the webinar series organized by the SLMA Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation. We are grateful to Dr. Samita Samanmali, Assistant Secretary of the SLMA Expert Committee on Rehabilitation for introducing us the today's speaker, Dr. Ashani Couchman, urological surgeon, Royal Adelaide Hospital, uh, Adelaide, Australia. Ashani, FRACS Urology 2013, FRACS Part 1, Royal Australasian College of Surgeons 2006, Part 2, 2010, and FRACS Urology 2013, is a constructive urologist with a specialty interest in neurourology and transitional neurology. She leads the Eurodynamic Service for the Central Adelaide Lucum Health Network, South Australia, and also the neurologist for the Hampstead Rehabilitation Center. Uh, she is the only transitional neurologist in the state, takes a lead role in the transfer of patients with a congenital or acquired urological anomaly from the pediatric to adult setting. She's a board member of the Continents Foundation of Australia and chair of the Children's and Young Persons Committee of the International Continents Society. She has followed fellowships at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, uh, Neurourology, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, and also University College London Hospital uh, for Adolescent Urology and Western General Hospital Edinburgh for Adult Reconstruction. She has many courses, she has followed many courses and certifications and out of many, the most recent being the Younger Fellows Forum, Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, in 2018 and operating the respect face-to-face -face component in 2018. Uh, there are many publications to the credit of Dr. Ashani Couchman. Uh, so with that brief introduction, uh, let me thank Ashani for accepting our invitation and for agreeing to deliver this presentation. Uh, over to you, Ashani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gunaratna. That's very kind of you. Um, it's very exciting to present to my people. I feel like I'm Sri Lankan, and this is a very exciting time. I don't get to see that many Sri Lankans, and there's a whole bunch of you out there. Uh, I have to apologize for my attire. I'm doing a cystectomy at the moment for a neurogenic patient, and my fellows are hopefully managing okay in the theater next door. So if there's a scream and there's a run, that's because I've been inevitably called in next door. Now I probably should get on with my talk. I'm going to try and share my screen. I have a range of slides and hopefully we'll have some time to chat at the end of it um, for, um, for any questions that you might have. Yes. Okay, so I'll get started with my presentation. Um, let me just share that. And please do tell me if you can see that well. Is that working okay? Yes, yes, we can see you. Wonderful. Now, if I move this over to a slideshow presentation format. Yes. In fact, I might. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the overview of you my talk. Make it screen. It may, uh, Sorry? The screen show. Enlarge it to screen show. Can I do that? We'll see. Can you see that? Yes, that's fine. Wonderful. Okay. 
So talking through the um, overview of my presentation, I'll start a little bit about with definitions and a bit about the pathophysiology of a neurogenic bladder, which is really my focus of interest and the focus of today's talk. Along with how am I evaluating patient and talking a little bit about management with an overview on urinary, sexual, and fertility functions as well as ultimately yes, follow up. I'm sure you understand quite Ashani? crucial. Ashani? There's a I think this is a very interesting slide and I think speaks that there's an interconnection with brain. And the blood. So neurourology. Can you hear me there? Yeah. yeah. There's a disturbance. Uh, what are you hearing? Uh, your voice tends to get sort of dragged. Padma, what are you hearing? Uh, now I could hear well. All right, we'll continue to uh, see. Can you hear me at all? We can hear you. We can hear you. Uh, it could be our internet. Yes. You can or can't? Now I can. You, you can? Yes. Just Good. continue to see. Tell me. Um, okay, speak up when you can't. Right. Okay, so as you know that there is a CNS component to the overarching control of social continents, but within that we have these very well described local Now, did, did you have a problem with that? Was somebody saying something? No, no, we are all right. No, okay, good. Um, a local and peripheral reflexes that we rely on for social confidence. You know, there's a reflex void that you expect as a child, which then is trained with the supertentorial component, which then allows us to control when a void can be released. So I think we have this prescribed reflex as is described by our textbooks, but then there is a much more sophisticated layering of controls that I don't think we have any true understanding of. There are a few more MRI-based studies that are looking at functional outcomes. However, we are yet to truly understand how the bladder would work. Classically speaking, in the face of a neurological insult, a suprapontine lesion is considered to cause an overactive bladder with a relatively stable sphincter, a normally acting sphincter. Spinal lesions tend to describe an overactive bladder with an overactive sphincter, traditionally seen as detrusor sphincter dyssynergia or a lack of cohesion between the bladder muscle and the sphincter. And finally, sacral or infrasacral lesions, and by that I mean pelvic floor lesions, predominantly demonstrates an underactivity of that bladder and either a normal active or underactive sphincter. So with that roadmap in mind, the evaluation of a patient, particularly with a Right, hopefully you should have that up now. Yes. Good. So I'll go back to the last few minutes and I said the evaluation history relies heavily on evaluating the person in front of you. So your general history is crucially important. You want to know what your background is, what the comorbidities are. Is this a young person sitting in front of you with a motor vehicle accident? Is it an older person? that's come through with a long history of NS or Parkinson's. And all of that will play a crucial part in the specific history around the bladder. Are they frequent, urgent? Do they feel like they're completely emptying? Is the void stop start? Recurrent UTIs, red flags like blood in the urine, are those evident? Is there a history of instrumentation? Do they intermittent? They catheterize? Do they have a urodome? Do they have a suprapubic? All of these things are pertinent to how you might then function. We know the gold standard of managing a neurogenic bladder 
is ideally, um, my internet keeps coming up as unstable. I'm in the main teaching hospital in South Australia. So we talked a little bit about assessing hand function and cognition in. Could you change the place where you are? long-term bladders and the care is that in being the standard for management of a thing however but you might find it okay. Take okay we'll try this here i've just done another talk here and it seems to have worked okay okay we'll try that but there, sorry is everything okay yeah. um but it will be noisy all right, because I'm it's in an open right. corridor. Right, it's all right. Okay, right. Yes. Can you still see my screen? Yes, can. Good, okay. Might actually be a bit better. So yes. if you're looking at examination, the key is your abdominal examination. Do you have a big pouch to manage? Do you have enough abdominal movement that you can focus on? Perhaps if you needed to place a stoma, you have a good area that you could actually put an appliance on. Are their reflexes appropriate? Are they able to tell you when they have any sensation? And do they have any anal tone? Now, this is particularly important for your female patients talking about their pelvic floor, pelvic floor laxity, and giving us an idea of what pelvic organ prolapse might, be, might look like down the line for them. Key evaluation or key tests that I think are important are the bladder diary. I find the bladder diary invaluable because it speaks to the functional capacity of the bladder, how well they're managing it and how much leak there actually is. You find that patients will underrepresent what they are feeling and what they are experiencing. And actually having it on paper allows you to monitor it ongoing, but also gives you a bit good idea of what your starting point is. I think it goes without saying that renal function, PSA in your male patients, particularly over the age of 50, because remember, patient, neurological patients also get all the other problems that any other person would get. Testicular home hormones, particularly in patients using long-term opioids, because there is a significant correlation between hypogonadism in this population and long-term opioid use. Baseline ultrasound of the renal tract or a CTKUB can be helpful. I find that ultrasounds can underestimate calculus volume because soft stones don't often show. Also in a large patient with a large amount of fat, it's very hard to get clear ultrasound pictures. Cystoscopy is useful, assessing the urethra and bladder size and trabeculation, as well as, of course, excluding bladder tumors. And finally, the gold standard in managing the bladder in a neurogenic patient is video cystometrograms, which are really highly necessarily at least once in the lifetime of the patient to try and ascertain whether you've got a hostile bladder here or whether that bladder is entirely manageable conservatively. So if you look at the EAU recommendations on managing the lower tract with regard to urodynamics, the strong strength of recommendation is that a urodynamic investigation is important, it's safe, it's repeatable, and it is crucial in clinical decision-making. It is thought to be mandatory before any invasive urodynamics are performed. And I think that is perhaps a little bit soft. I would normally do invasive urodynamics for 99.9% .9 of my patients that present over the age of 10. I use a physiological filling rate and warm saline. Now, if anybody doesn't understand what I mean by a video system metrogram, I will be talking about it further down the talk. I'm, in, I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions down the line. There's, this is an excellent paper that talks through the standardized terminology that we should all be using. So we're all speaking the same language and we also understand what we mean when somebody describes, for example, detrusor overactivity. I would recommend you have this in your armamentarium because this will just standardize everything across the world. And this is what we use to talk about specifying the bladder pathology.
So the key points in neurodynamics, we fill the bladder to see what the fill phase is. You ensure the fill is slow. You use a small catheter and importantly, watch for autonomic dysreflexia. I talk about that in a minute. The other key triggers are triggered detrusor contractions. Often it's cough associated. Detrusor leak point pressure, anything over 40 centimeters of water has a very high risk of deterioration of the upper tracts. Your compliance, which is the stretchiness of your bladder and of course leak. Sensation is very helpful because if somebody can feel when the bladder is getting full, that really assists in managing how the bladder is then subsequently emptied. And voiding may not be possible for all. So you would be looking at the voiders and looking at whether or not you've got an element of detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. We talked about that just before. And of course, dysfunctional voiding, where there is poor flow in the face of a very high pelvic floor tone or very low detrusor contraction or a combination thereof. I always use fluoroscopy for my urodynamics, and that is really important because it does demonstrate reflux in real time. Reflux, interestingly, doesn't always occur with a detrusor leak point pressure of 40, however, can occur before then. Diverticular, fistula, and DSD can only be diagnosed with fluoroscopy. Why? You want to see a very full proximal urethra with a closed mid-urethral sphincter. That classic picture cannot be seen outside of a fluoroscopy. And again, terminology is very important. We should be talking about the same thing at the same time. So that when somebody says, this patient has neurogenic detrusor overactivity with hostile pressures, you then know exactly what they mean and there is minimal confusion. This I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with. Autonomic dysreflexia, it is a medical emergency triggered by this pathway that you can see really beautifully demonstrated in this diagram. Any um, viscous organ distension can set this off, so be it um, a very full rectum or um, bladder neck obstruction or retention. I have found in my patients with long-term catheters, which have been on free drainage for quite some time, the bladder then contracts around the catheter balloon and sets off dysreflexia even with the catheter balloon. Two weeks ago, I took a bladder out of a patient of mine with a C5 incomplete quadriplegia, basically because he couldn't blow his balloon up at all because he was setting off dysreflexia in his small acorn-sized bladder. So that is a key and important medical condition that the patient needs to be aware of so they can seek help, speak out, but particularly the carers or people around them need to be aware of because it needs to be dealt with immediately. Signs and symptoms are, as you can see here, you've got the reference to the paper. I will send my slide deck and you can actually get a bit more information about it through that. I'm not going to labor the point here today. So education I do feel in dysreflexia is probably the most important. The key here is to exclude distension, constipation and initiate some pharmacological management if after those initial means have not resulted in a reduction in their blood pressure and an improvement in their heart rate. And you can see the pathway that we use most commonly here. Okay, so management, reflex voiding. We thought we'd talk a little bit about terminology here again. Bladder expression, and that is expressing urine from the bladder. A couple of different ways to do it, the Crede maneuver, downward movement or suprapubic pressure or a Valsalva, which is an abdominal strain. Now, this is not considered to be a gold standard or a good way of managing bladders long-term, but I am aware that in certain populations, this might be the least worst option. Because if you don't have regular catheter changes, regular catheter drainage, this might be the safest way of doing so. However, this does put that patient at risk of long-term upper tract deterioration. Triggered voiding is basically stimulating the sacral dermatomes to get on. 
and often it's utilizable in an upper motor neuron lesion. And you do wonder whether this plays a part in how we see sacral neuromodulation working in our population. So I'm doing that a lot more in my chordae equina patients and also walking spina bifida patients. And that's a really interesting progression in our management of bladders that are unable to void um, in 2020, 2021. We've talked about the history, we've talked about presentation, we've talked about looking at the patient globally. Evaluation, we've touched on, key danger points we've touched on, and I think we need to really talk about management principles. So in urology, our main principles here is achievement or maintenance of continence, because you want to support your patient being active and a member of society and not feeling like they're being a burden. You want to maintain the upper tracts because that is key in not deteriorating their renal function. Try our best to restore the lower urinary tract function to a degree. I think this is variable. And most importantly, maintaining their quality of life, which is what we are very much responsible for. And I think the needs of these patients really do change. I touched on it earlier. So you've got a newborn, you know, you're very focused on preservation of renal function. In school age, you're talking a little bit about continence. In adolescence, we're talking about independence, sexual function, and then onwards for fertility. So I think depending on where your patient is, you want to overlay where they are. Over that, you want to think about what their neural pathology is, what their cognitive function is. Are they able to process what you're saying? Are they able to understand it in time or are they able to understand it now? Are socioeconomic factors going to impinge on their ability to access things like regular catheters, regular stoma devices and regular follow-up and geography? Patients who are quite far away from their local, local major hospital should really be managed in a way that if there is an immediate emergency, the local hospital will be able to remediate that to a degree and then send them on for onward help. And finally, you've got to think about your anatomy. Are we talking about a problem with the bladder, the outlet, the upper tracts, or a combination of all of them? So... Think about your bladder, think about the outlets and the upper tracts, what level of the um, patient's lifespan are we at, newborn, school age or adolescent. Finally, the social overlay. What is the neural pathology? What's the cognition, socioeconomic and geographic factors that will play a significant part in your decision making with regard to your patients? What we can't forget is aging and fertility. Now, aging is a real major concern because our patients are living longer because we're doing better at keeping them alive. But if they're living longer, their aging problems are going to be very much like the population surrounding them, but their problems might be much more um, complicated because of their background. So let's just talk a little bit about management and first line management of bladder dysfunction really is oral therapies. Antimuscarinics are excellent at addressing diffuser overactivity and in studies undertaken in patients under 10, pretty good at managing bladder pressures. Oral or intravesical therapies can be utilized with the antimuscarinics, but important to note really here is that in antimuscarinic loads of more than two grams a day, there is a significant risk of bringing on dementia early. And by that, I'm talking about the old school ditropan or oxybutynin that we traditionally use. There is the added complication of the constipation risk, the fact that you cannot use it with glaucoma. And I think those are important considerations when you're looking at your patient and the aging patient. Newer on the market is the beta adrenergic agonist. We're talking about Betmega here. It's been around for about 15 years. Risks are pretty low, theoretical risk of increasing the blood pressure, but probably not that effective in patients who have very refractory detrusor overactivity. And finally, don't forget the outlet and don't forget alpha blockade as a good first line therapy for outlet obstruction in the aging neurogenic male. Catheters are often a mainstay of how we then manage the medication as well as the bladder and the patient. And as I said before, the gold standard would be clean, intermittent self-catheterization. Realistically, I think we are getting very good at catheters. There are multiple, there are many, many different types. Different hand functions can manage them. They're also self-lubricated, single use, which I think can actually promote bladder health, reduce UTIs and reduce the theoretical risk of trauma. Don't under underestimate the power of a good suprapubic catheter in combination with good bladder management, because you can actually keep someone continent, 
not have them transferring all the time to undertake intermittent catheterization, and with a tap, not need a bag through the day. An indwelling catheter is always an option. The infection rate is the same as a suprapubic catheter. And I think in some patients who don't want surgical intervention, I'm quite happy to manage it and have done so for a long time. This is a perfectly valid option. A urodome is helpful for some patients historically who have used um, sphincterotomy as one of their management options. Personally, I've not done any sphincterotomies in my career and my aim is to not undertake them. I think they're destructive, they're unhelpful, and you are left in the end with patients who are in their 60s or 70s, 40 or 50 years post spinal cord injury, who are leaking into their pressure ulcers. And there's no way that you can control that DO contraction and leak because you have no sphincter to work with. So I've done a couple of urethral closures for these patients with Botox and a suprapubic as a way of actually gaining the continence they require. And that's worked relatively well, but I still think that's not the best long-term option. Don't forget the UTI risk with these patients. Try and prevent where you can. I use a range of different options, either a preventative antibiotic for a period of three months. There are SUBG or alkaline washes that are very helpful that I use once a week to keep the debris at bay. And finally, there's a new pH neutral solution called Microdox, which I also use in certain patients that are not augmented with the bowel segment for keeping that bladder nice and neutral and reducing the biofilm formation of those catheters. Treat the UTIs quickly with sensitive antibiotics for a period of seven days, ensure the catheter is changed on the first day and work on education for ongoing prevention. This is a huge slide because I think it just, it covers a lot of ground. Um, I do all of these procedures outlined here but not everything fits everyone at every time. So you might find that you're working well with Botox for a period of time. So Botox has been shown to be excellent in certain patients with spinal cord injury with at least a 25 year follow-up. It tends to reduce the need for things like an augmentation cystoplasty. However, there is a proportion of people with increased fibrous change in their bladders whose response to Botox seems to be waning. And when you reach that point and the bladder is contracting, then I think you have to seriously consider an augmentation. If your bladder then contracts beyond the level that you can augment, which for me is about 100 mil bladder, then you would be really thinking about an allele conduit diversion because there's very little you can do with a very small, very hard, very overactive or underactive bladder. Bladder neck procedures are relatively destructive and I talked a little bit about the sphincterotomy, which I don't do. That's why I've got exclamation points there. And constructive, useful in the aging female. Bulking agents I use really well in the older female neurogenic patient. Works well with a combination of upper urinary drive diversion in the form of perhaps a suprapubic catheter. And my choice is Bulkamid. It's a lovely agent and I tend to inject them maybe once a year and often one or two injections suffice. L low in morbidity, high in efficacy, very low erosion rate with no con concurrent infection rates, which is great. I do put in artificial urinary sphincters, either at the bladder neck or the bulbar urethra in the males, bladder neck in the females, as a really good way of controlling that outlet so you can open it when you want to catheterize, and particularly somebody that catheterize on a recurrent basis, having a bladder neck that's supported with an AUS is safer because you have more bladder cuffing that cuff to reduce your risk of erosion. Autologous slings are also excellent in this regard, but obviously much more useful in the female population. In the males, I don't do a proact balloon, but the AUS is what I prefer, but certainly a sling would be another option. But if they are self-catheterizing, I wouldn't use an artificial sling purely because of the erosion rate. I talked about sacral neuromodulation. I do that in some of my patients that are appropriate with overactivity or dysfunctional voiding. And the augmentation cystoplasty, I probably do three or four a year, um, and they do very well. Um, in the long term, it's very helpful. There is the secondary malignancy risk. Um, so I do cystoscope them every year after about four to five years of their augment. Now, if they are uh, someone with a history of previous pelvic or 
abdominal radiation, I will surveil them every year from the inception because of their high risk of metastatic cancer detection. And an ileal conduit diversion is safe end stage and tends to do very well, but you do have to time it so that you are not struggling for eight and a half hours taking your bladder out. We talk a little bit about bladder rehabilitation in this with electrical stimulation, I touched on it. So I find PTS very helpful in the ambulant older MS patient, and that is percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. It is non-invasive. It is very tolerable. It improves symptoms by about 70%. And you can use that as an adjunct to your oral therapies if they are tolerated. Um, the peripheral temporary electro electrical stimulation, there's less evidence around. I don't tend to do it. I don't think it's as efficacious. Um, and intravesical neurostimulation is new. I'm watching this. I haven't really tempted it. I'm not sure I understand the pathophysiology of it. Um, but I think that's something that I want to keep an eye on. And finally, transcranial magnetic stimulation is something that's happening in the research space um, and might be something to watch in the future. Very much like the deep brain stimulators in Parkinson's causing a very significant improvement in bladder function in this population, I find that this might be something that's useful down the line for particular patients. So something to watch here in the future. I've got there a picture of one of my colleagues, her name is Tonya Mazzini. She's a um, sex therapist. Um, and often with sexual function, and we, very, very, we don't talk about this very much, and particularly with females, we don't talk about this at all. The greatest barrier to a successful sexual life in this population is really the urinary incontinence. Deal with that, the confidence comes back. But you want to be really talking and supporting the change in the way the sexual functions will work, change in the way that sensation will work and lubrication will work. And with sympathetic conversation, you can actually make that experience much, much better. But if you don't broach it, they are not going to ask. As is typical in this sort of situation, the males have much more research around this than the females do, unfortunately. And first line, of course, PDE5 inhibitors are excellent. Vacuum devices and rings are great. But I tend to worry about those in patients with poor hand function because you are relying on a, another party to be responsible for that. Intracavernosa injections, all useful as are penile prostheses. Again, careful consideration and careful discussion is necessary to try and ensure that you're picking the right procedure for the right patient for the right reason. Finally, let's talk a little bit about fertility. Um, you do need an MDT for this. Um, you need your friendly gynecologist, fertility specialist, friendly colorectal surgeon, and you have multiple stages here. We're talking about implantation, getting that pregnancy through, and then delivery. So all of that requires input from multiple people, and you need a team with you to do that. But there isn't a barrier to fertility in, say, a spinal cord lesion that we should be talking about, we should be supporting. And if we do it right, the delivery is safe and the mum is safe. Um, and finally, with men, with their fertility, Electric ejaculation can be very, very helpful, but of course, if not, a testicular extraction of sperm is also quite useful. And we have enough techniques now to allow for in vitro fertilization or implantation of embryos, which then helps. Um, one of the best quotes I've had was from one of my patients who sent me a, a message saying, hi, Shani, here are some photos of Maggie, his daughter, who's three weeks old. It's been the best point of my life. This man, he's 28, he had a traumatic spinal cord injury only two years before. Um, he just got married, they just bought a farm and basically his truck hit another truck and that was what he felt was the end of his life. But he felt like he was awake again, alive again, looking to the future. So I feel like your responsibility as a physician or a surgeon dealing with this population is helping them look forward and helping them do so with strength, courage, and dignity. And if you do that, then it is extremely rewarding. Finally, you can't do this work without having accurate and appropriate follow-up. I try and run a tight ship with my patients. I have amazing rehab physicians. I work with renal physicians. I've mentioned the obstetricians and of course my registrars and fellows. Um, and we ensure that we do it. So we do follow them up. There is a rotor, they have a plan. The patients know what their plan is or their carers do. 
and each plan is tailored to that patient. You have to have their general practitioner involved in their care, otherwise you're not going to be able to deliver it locally, because it might be that your patient can't come to see you every year due to geography, um, finances, or simply because they don't want to. So you need to have a plan to make sure that they are safe in the community. I think that really runs through my talk, which is a really quick um, run through of neurology as a whole and things I think about and things I think are important um, considerations in this population. Um, I'm happy to uh, be open to any questions at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Ashani, for that uh, excellent presentation. Um, I, I just start with a question myself. I'm a pediatric neurologist, so I am just uh, just want to know what is your pediatric exposure, because I know that you have trained in Great Ormond Street Hospital as well. Um, so, yeah, I work, I work really closely with my colleagues in the pediatric hospital. So I visit in the pediatric hospital and I basically operate on anyone over five. So we work together in that I deal with the outflow work. So augments, sphincters, talking through the complicated patients, the cloacas, the epispadius patients. Because I think realistically with these patients, you see them initially they have this amazing support and they kind of hit about 18 and then they have nowhere to go. And often the adult services actually don't understand complexity of the congenital anomaly. So I do a clinic with them. I go in and operate with them. So they see me and they know me before they come over. To be fair, this service is in its inception here in Adelaide. We've probably only been doing it for about a year and we're still learning and getting better. It certainly wasn't as great as it was at GOSH, but you know, we'll get there hopefully. Right, <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Um, just let me check the chat. Um, are there any questions from the audience? The, um, uh, Saraji, just would be interested in knowing that whether they use a long-term antibiotics for, uh, for the recurrent uh, uh, urinary incontinence for uh, females, particularly elderly? Um, I don't use um, long-term antibiotics unless my problem is recurrent urinary tract infections that trigger the leak. So after doing an initial assessment to exclude any anatomical or pathological things, so looking for stones, looking for TCCs, looking for VDFs, whatever, you find that they are purely getting recurrent infections. I then try and support the estrogenization. So I use topical estrogens quite liberally. I'll do a three month course of preventative antibiotics to treat the recurrent infections. And those antibiotics will be targeted to the bacterial growth. So their culture will demand or dictate what that um, antibiotic is. But as a pure treatment for incontinence in the elderly, no, I do not use um, long-term prophylactic antibiotics. Thank you. Um, there are some questions on the chat. Did you want me to respond to them as I go along or? Yes. Oh, there's one, <laughs> one question. Um, from Chamara. You're welcome, Chamara. And um, would I uh, recommend antimuscarinix for patients on self catheterization? Do you know what? There are two reasons I would. If they're self capping, I've done their urodynamics and the pressures are hostile, then yes, I would recommend an antimuscarinic. If they're self capping and we've demonstrated detrusor overactivity, then I would as well. Um, and I find that that really helps with controlling the leak and controlling the frequency and ideally controlling the urge. What pelvic floor exercises are? Um, that's a very uh, broad question. Um, so I suppose it falls into two categories. One group will be able to feel their pelvic floor. So they will be able to engage in the appropriate pelvic contraction, be able to hold it, and release it slowly and you can get a physio to help with that really well. The other group struggle, struggle to feel the pelvic floor, engage the pelvic floor. Now in that group, I do use uh, biofeedback. Um, I use a vaginal or rectal probe with a TENS machine 
where there is a stimulated electrical contraction for that pelvic floor. Now, only a handful of my patients use it because a lot of them find the probe very confronting because it's really big and bulky and you have to put it in yourself and they don't really like that. The ones that have used it have found actually it's really good for the stress incontinence component. Where it doesn't work very well are the patients who don't have a pelvic floor. So it might be a um, anorectal malformation or someone that has had a massive pelvic floor disruption during the MBA, and you might find that their muscle is actually replaced by scar or fibrosis, you're going to really struggle to engage that group. Ah, how, how Botox helps in patients as folks post-enterotomy. Okay, so this particular patient I made reference to had a really bad pressure ulcer and the plastic surgeons were getting very upset because urine was getting all over their very pretty repair um, as they always do get upset about. So when we did his aerodynamics, he had a very small, very overactive, very high pressure bladder. Now, there was no ability for us to manage that orally. So we started with giving him Botox and leaving him with a urethral catheter. Now, he continued to leak around that catheter, partly because he had no opposition or apposition around that catheter, around the sphincter, and also partly because, you know, wide open drainage of a very small bladder. So in that setting, Botox is helpful if you can keep the urine in the bladder and not leaking around the catheter. If we do that and it's still reeking around the urethral catheter, it's no longer that helpful. And if you want them to stop leaking, then really you have no choice but to divert the urine upwards. And in his case, we did a suprapubic Botox, which gave him some capacity. And I closed off his um, urethra, actually. And that was the way to manage that. Now, if you are putting Botox in somebody with a sphincterotomy with a urodome, you have to be very clear that they are not relying on any element of reflex voiding to empty their bladder into that urodome. Because what you will then do is essentially reduce the bladder impetus to push that urine out. So in some cases, that can be a problem. Females with a functional outlet obstruction or catheter dependent, would you, that's a really hard question. Functional obstruction is such a difficult um, thing. Um, because I tend not to do a bladder neck incision. If I can help it, I would do bladder neck Botox before I would do bladder neck incision because I feel like it'll be less destructive and reversible. Um, and I do find that I'm doing more um, neuromodulation for these patients. So if they are open to it, now the neuromodulator is MRI compatible. So very much better for the um, neurogenic patient to use. So that's what I do use. So short answer to that is I don't do, I don't do a BNI on ladies. Um, just out of curiosity, was the urethral closure done? So like, no, I'm, a, I'm an old fashioned open surgeon. So I put a cut and <laughs> closed the urethra. Um, it was very satisfying. Um, what is the recommended antibiotic when given for three months of prophylaxis? Okay, so you've got bacteriostatic antibiotics or bactericidal antibiotics, yes. I find in the younger population, the Orprim, which is bacteriostatic, works relatively well. But in someone who's older with lots of exposure to antibiotics, this will just not work so well. So I look to their cultures. And there, in fact, I have a young woman, well, she's not that young, she's 38, um, with an anorectal malformation who is actually on Norflox prophylaxis at the moment, which is really not ideal because we have now run out of antibiotics to use for her for prophylaxis. So I think really making sure that you are giving an antibiotic that's sensitive to the actual culture is crucial because we're going to run out of options. How often do the cultures to look at? Um, anytime there's a symptomatic UTI, I do a culture. Uh, um, um, one more question, Ashani. Uh, do you do a lot of ileal conduits or in, especially in yeah, children? Yeah, I do. Uh -huh. I do. Well, it's really interesting. People find ileal conduits not that great, you know, but in some patients, you just have no choice. Um, I, I, I have, I've watered and augmented once, once in my career. And that was in a young man who's 17, who had uh, a lot of um, local radiotherapy for a, a spinal tumor. 
And I did his aerodynamics and six months later, he came forward for his augment and his bladder was rigid, it was rigid, stuck to the pelvic wall and probably about that big. And I technically couldn't get, a con you know, get an augmented segment on that and be confident that he would then function well, quite apart from the fact that his urethra was completely stuffed. So I recommended a conduit for them because I think even compared to a neobladder, in someone that's had such major radiation change, I would be worried about what their absorption is going to be like down the line. He's only 17. So yes, I think a conduit is a great option for some patients. And you know, if you've got someone who's geographically isolated, conduit is very safe, very safe because the urine comes out. Where's it gonna go, you know? Yeah. Um, just wondering whether there are any more questions. Um. Uh, what is your experience with intravesical baclofen? How effective is it? I, I don't think it works. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a bit of voodoo. So I don't use it. <laughs> I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, Ashani. Uh, I think it was really nice uh, listening to you and um, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and I would like to thank Dr. Samita for inviting you uh, and hopefully uh, you would be able to help us in the near future maybe with our other talks and you know conferences maybe. Okay. Oh, I would love that. I would love that. And you know what? If COVID wasn't a problem, I'd be love. I'd be. It would be so lovely to visit. Um, so, look, thank you very much for having me. And I'm sorry to be difficult with the cystectomy, but we managed. And I have yeah. nobody's run out in panic, so we're okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashani. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all who participated. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks.